and visit what looks like such a beautiful, beautiful place. So um, hopefully next year, if you'll have me back, um, fingers crossed, everything will be much more back to normal. Now, I'm just going to share my screen, she says confidently. So hopefully you can all see that now. Somebody will give me a nod in the chat, hopefully, if you can't. And um, uh, thank you, Chloe, for that lovely intro as well. Yes, um, I am an ordinary knackered mum of two. And, and I say that because I think it's really important that we um, sort of break down maybe a lot of these stereotypes that I think there are about sustainable living and, um, you know, that it's it's only for a, a certain sector of society or it's for the kind of uber greenies or anything like that. But I really firmly believe that we can all make a really big difference. So um, it's called sustainable in 60 minutes, this little talk I'm going to do for you. Um, it's going to be less than 60 minutes because we're going to leave time at the end for um, Q&A for any questions that you've got. So as Chloe said, if you've got any questions, do just pop them into the chat box. I haven't got the chat box up because I will get distracted by it because I have the attention span of a, uh, a squirrel or some, something with a very small attention span. Um, so do just pop them into there and um, somebody who is better at multitasking than me will be collating them together and um, we can go through them all at the end or just ask, pop them into the question box at the end. So off we go, she says, and it's not moving forwards. There we go, brilliant. So just a very, very little quick bit about me. Um, so yeah, I am an ordinary knackered mum of two. My, I used to be a vet. My journey into uh, sustainability and all things sustainable living began, um, where are we now, 2012, eight years ago? Gosh, that's scary, isn't it? Um, I slightly randomly decided we were going to spend a year buying nothing new as a family. and. I thought we were pretty green because we did our recycling and as far as I was concerned that was that was what made you a bona fide kind of eco hero um but I absolutely hadn't joined the dots between um what we were buying um and the impact that it was having on sort of people and planet and and when I when we were thinking about buying stuff it, it was very often not a very thoughtful process other than you know where we might be able to find it cheapest where things might be on offer um didn't really occur to me to to look for lots of things secondhand prior to this year buying nothing new um which I think is possibly a situation that that lots of us are in and I think um uh I was aware of, um, you know, this was, so this was eight years ago, this was pre Blue Planet 2, this was pre um, Greta, pre the school strikes, you know, awareness of the, the climate crisis as we're now referring to it was much, much lower back then. So I was kind of aware that stuff, you know, it was, it was not good, uh, but assumed that, you know, we'd have, we had plenty of time and that, it couldn't really be that bad because if it was that bad, then surely the government would be jumping up and down and, and doing something about it and responding, I guess, in a similar way to they have um, for um, COVID-19. Um, and, and I think maybe that that's what a lot of us feel like. Well, it can't be that bad because um, they, they surely they would be doing something about it. And unfortunately, as we're going to um, find out on the next slide, I think it, it kind of is that bad. And no, they're not doing anything about it. Um, so I really firmly believe that, that, yes, we need government and we need businesses to be taking action, but that, that as individuals, we have a really significant role to play. Um, so that year of nothing new, I blogged about it. I, I blogged every day for the year, which um, actually was far more difficult than um, buying nothing new and um, built up this sort of community around what I was doing, discovered all these amazing projects, all these amazing people doing these brilliant things. Um, and now eight years on, that's sort of all morphed into what is now um, sustainable-ish. We've got an online community of um, sort of at least 50,000 people when I look at um all the different social media platforms and um, uh, email lists and all those kinds of things. And, and it's all about taking imperfect eco action. Um, earlier on this year, I founded the Knackered Mums Eco Club um, and did that very much as, as a reaction, like I said at the very beginning, to these ideas that, that in order to be doing anything, we've got to be these full on eco hippies. And that I think there's an awful lot of people who wouldn't necessarily um, associate or, or um, recognize themselves as sort of you know, someone who's into sustainability, but there's an awful lot of people who um, think of themselves who can relate to being knackered mums and and actually mums. Um, this isn't to exclude anybody at all, but this is just to say that that um, as mums, I think we have a huge amount of power um, because 
slightly sadly, uh, you know, into, even in today's society, we are still the ones making the majority of the buying decisions. And as we'll find out, um, you know, our consumption does have a significant impact. And um, the reason I've been invited here today is because I am, um, as Chloe said, the author of the sustainable -ish Living Guide. So that was my first book it came out um, in January. Uh, it's been an interesting year for to have a book coming out, um, all the um, events and all those kinds of things and festivals that, that were planned for promotion have sadly lots of them been cancelled. And so huge thanks to, um, to Beric and the team there for, for going online and for carrying on with this. It really does make a difference, I think, for um, especially first time authors who are trying to sort of um, get a bit of momentum and get established. Um, so I'm just gonna very briefly just talk about the problem just because I feel like um, probably if you've signed up for this talk, you're probably well aware of the problem, but I still think that there's, um, a lot of people out there who kind of are aware of the climate crisis, aware that things aren't good, but maybe kind of, maybe we're a little bit guilty of not talking enough about what the um, what the potential scenarios might look like because we don't want to scare the pants off people. Um, so this isn't intended to scare the pants off you. This is just intended to say like this is the the science. As far as I'm concerned, it's not up for debate. Um, and um, we're going to focus the rest of the talk on solutions. Um, because I don't know about you, but I find when I think about the, the problem and the, um, the issues that we're faced with, I find it quite paralyzing. I find it quite overwhelming. I find it quite anxiety inducing. So for me, the antidote to all that is to focus on solutions, which we're going to do very, very quickly, uh, very, very shortly. Um, so we are already seeing the consequences of, of one degree of warming globally. So the, the temperature, the global average temperature is now at one degree warmer than it was um, sort of pre-industrial revolution. Um, and we're already seeing more extreme weather, even here in the um, in the UK, we, you know, we're seeing um, more frequent flooding, um, you know, weird freaky, was it February it was really warm this year or was it last year? Like, you know, really freaky kind of unseasonal weather but across the globe, we're seeing rising sea levels, diminishing Arctic sea ice. And one degree doesn't sound too bad, does it? Like, I wouldn't be able to tell you if my bath was, you know, um, I don't even know what appropriate temperature is for a bath. Um, OK, my cup of tea. If my cup of tea was, um, you know, 96 degrees or 95 degrees, wouldn't have a clue. It's not it doesn't seem like that big a deal, but it it is a big deal when it comes to the planet and all the ecosystems that coexist. What we want to try and do is we want to try and limit global warming, uh, average temperatures warming to one and a half degrees. And it is possible, but doing so, this was the IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I'm always quite pleased with myself when I remember that um, report that came out at the end of 2018. It is possible, but it would require unprecedented changes. Unprecedented changes sounds quite daunting, doesn't it? It sounds like we're going to have to move heaven and earth. Um, but actually, when I... <laughs> I had to look it up in a dictionary, unprecedented, it just means doing something we haven't done before. So we can all do that. We can all do stuff we haven't done before. We can all do stuff in a slightly different way. And the, the big changes that we need, um, you know, are going to be unprecedented changes by governments and by businesses. But as I said a, a little minute ago, I firmly believe that as individuals, we have a role to play and an unprecedented change as individuals doesn't have to sound as daunting as it, as it might do. So the current trajectory that we're on, we're looking at about a three degree rise by um, 2100, um, 2100, how do we say that? I don't know. Um, I might not be alive then, my kids probably will be. So I think that's when it starts to become quite, thinking about how old my kids are gonna be in the year um, 2100. Um, and we'll hit one and a half degrees anywhere between 2030 and 2050. Now. My kids are currently, what, 12 and nine. So 2030, they're gonna be 22 and 19. Um, that for me really brings it home to me that, that this is potentially the, the world that they're going to be facing. Um, the, the global commitments that have been made aren't sufficient to keep temperature rise um, below, I should say, shouldn't it? Um, not sufficient to prevent, you know, that doesn't make sense, prevent temperature rise above two degrees C, let alone one and a half degrees C. So, and, and I think David Attenborough um, said this, that the decisions we're making today are absolutely vital to ensure a safe and sustainable future for everybody, both now and in the future. So, you know, when it can feel really pointless about, um, do I worry about um, a straw or a, a coffee cup or things like that? Actually, we are reaching a point where every single decision does count. And that's not to say, that I'm expecting anybody to make the perfect decision every single time because I certainly don't do that. But the idea that you know millions and billions of us can make better decisions more of the time really, really does make an impact. 
So I talk a lot about sustainable ish and um, and that's very deliberate, the ish, because I think when we talk about sustainability, sustainable living, it sounds really quite dull. It sounds very earnest, very worthy, like it's going to be really hard work, like we're going to have to. Uh, move into a yurt and learn how to weave our own yogurt from lentils and you know give up all the nice things in life and and for me actually you know we need um there's this brilliant quote by a lady called Anne-Marie Bonneau who's the zero waste chef on social media and she says we don't need you know, a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly we need millions of people doing it imperfectly and it's exactly the same for sustainable living so uh, as far as I'm concerned it is very much about taking imperfect action so um, when I talk about sustainable ish I'm talking about making the best choices that you can that work for you and your family and for the planet and they're going to be different for everybody because everybody's starting from a different place everybody's got different challenges and circumstances some one person's amazing is going to be someone else's meh, and, and vice versa and that is absolutely okay accepting you know being really um, encouraging of the fact that no change is too small and that the whole time what we're aiming for is progress and not perfection and that we focus on the things that we can change and not the things that we can't because some things do require big system change they do require um you know policy changes and things like that and whilst we can use our voices to to encourage those things to happen and um, there are some things that you know at the moment we can't change so the reason i've got those two other pictures on there the the triangle at the top is because I think there's a perception that that we think there's this sort of green hierarchy that we think um that we start at the bottom as the very palest of pale greens and we're working our way up to the top in a very linear fashion to be the greenest of uber crunchy green person and we're looking for this pinnacle of green perfection and which there is no such thing as as far as I'm concerned so for me it's very much more like this bottom picture and um, which is this messy splodge of different shades of green and we're different shades of green in different areas of our lives and we're different shades of green in lockdown versus not in lockdown with the kids at home with the kids at school with uh, depending on how annoying the kids are being how tired we are all those kinds of things and that is absolutely okay um so that is sustainable ish in a nutshell um in the book um the Sustainable Ish Living Guide, there are 12 chapters in there and I don't have time to go through 12 chapters with you. Uh, so I've kind of picked out six areas or six of the chapters, I guess, where I think we can have a really big impact as individuals. And the first one is conscious consumption. Um, and this absolutely, my all time favorite, I think it probably is my all time favorite picture, um, is the Biarchy of Needs from an amazing um, Canadian called Sarah Lazarovich. And um, it's based on Maslow's, or very loosely, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the idea is that we start at the bottom and we're working and we, and we do those, we do that first and we work our way up to the top. So buy is kind of a little bit of a last resort. Um, so I will just very quickly run through that. So using what you have, the most sustainable version of anything is the one you already have. So um uh you know if somebody brings out an all singing all dancing new more sustainable version of a coffee cup it's not actually a reusable coffee cup it's it's still more sustainable for you to carry on using the one you've already got um and a lot of the time when I spoke to, I spoke to Sarah um she very kindly came on my podcast in the run-up to the book coming out and she says you know in that use what you have sector she includes repairing she includes upcycling all those kinds of things so sort of taking the stuff you've already got and um, making it suit the need that you have. And I think that's really, really important because when certainly when we were um, doing our year buying nothing new and I sort of started to explore all these places that had um, secondhand stuff. So obviously there's charity shops, but, you know, car boots and um, flea markets and antique um, uh, vintage fairs and all those sorts of things. There is so much stuff already in the world and it's just mind boggling that rate at which we're still producing stuff. So using what we have is absolutely, I think, a really key tenant of um, sustainable living. And when um, I think uh, one of the perceptions or one of, maybe one of the barriers for people when thinking about sustainable living and green and eco is that it's more expensive um, and and yes oftentimes things are more expensive um, when we think about ethical fashion and organic foods and things because we're actually paying uh, the true we're seeing a truer cost of the reflection of the price of that but actually you know one of the very core things of sustainable living is reducing our consumption David Attenborough um 
said recently um there's a new podcast out on bbc sounds and i can't remember if it was in that or if it was in um some of the promo he was doing for that on the bbc but saying you know levels of consumption need to stall here in the developed world we need to sort of just take a pause take a breath um we we consume so mindlessly sounds a bit harsh but I think you know I, I was very guilty of doing this and and to a certain extent sometimes I think I still am you know we, we buy things because we're bored because we're happy because we're sad because we're you know very very rarely because we actually need something so let's just take a breath take a pause and um look around to see what we've already have that have got that we can use the next level up is borrowing and Yes, that is a little bit harder at the moment because of um, Corona. So, um, but in ordinary times, there are, um, um, you know, you can borrow from friends and family. So always see if you can do that. You can borrow from um, increasingly around the country, certainly pre-COVID popping up where um, libraries of things. So share shops, we've got one near us in um, Froome. And the idea is that it's, it's just like a library and you can go and you can, you can borrow the thing that you need rather than have to buy it. In Edinburgh, there's the most amazing um, tool library, Edinburgh Tool Library. And again, it works like a library, but for tools. And you go and you borrow the tools that you need because apparently the average drill is only used for an average of something like 13 minutes in its lifetime. So if we can all start to, to, to borrow more um, and take part in this, what we call the sharing economy, then it will reduce the demand on resources. Swapping again was probably much easier pre-COVID, um, but still, uh, you know, can be done and is still something to bear in mind once hopefully things start please, to um, calm down a little bit. Um, so you can, you know, you can do informal swaps with friends and family. You could get together, especially pre-Christmas with friends with kids the same age and do a swap of um, maybe, you know, when the kids are at school or at preschool, so they can't see their things disappearing and suddenly decide that was their favorite toy ever, but you can do a toy swap. Um, you can do clothes swaps again between friends or you can go to official swishes, which are just clothes swap, a posh word for clothes swaps. Um, so hopefully, you know, these are all things to bear in mind once, um, once we're a little bit more on top of a certain virus. Um, thrifting is just American or Canadian for secondhand and, and the graphic there saying think secondhand first. So um, obviously I'm a massive advocate now of buying secondhand, um, having spent that year buying nothing new. And, and um, the, the most valuable thing I think I found from, um, from that year buying nothing new was just that stopgap that, you know, in between, um, oh, I need that or that looks nice or I want that oh, I'm gonna to have to find it secondhand. So by the time you've had to sort of pause and take a breath and look around and see where you can find it secondhand, nine times out of 10, you've forgotten, you know, that you even wanted it. And this is a thing I do with the kids as well. So if the kids, um, you know, manage to um, bully me into taking them into a toy shop or whatever, and then um, and they'll be going, oh, I really want this, I really want this, despite me saying, we can go in, but we're not gonna buy anything. Um, I'll take a pic, I'll say, right, I'm gonna take a picture of it on my phone. If you remember it, um, in, in a week's time, then we can have a little look and, or we, you know, we can put it on your birthday list or we could put it on your Christmas list. And I think it's a really useful thing for us to do as grown ups too. If we see a, an outfit that we really like or a top that we really want, just take a picture or put it in your basket online. And if you still remember it in a week, then maybe, you know, have a think about it. But um, I think that, you know, it, just having this little stop gap in between, I want it or I've seen it and I want and I need it um, and actually buying it. Um, making is, is making a big, making is making a comeback. Um, you know, there are now just sort of whole communities um, around um, sewing and crochet and knitting. And um, one of the things at the Edinburgh Tool Library that they do, you know, they'll do workshops, helping people sort of do carpentry and basic DIY and things like that. So, and once you've made something yourself, I think you're so much more aware of the the time and effort and resources that have gone into making stuff. And so you're much, much less likely to throw things out, I think. And then at the very top of the hierarchy, we've got buy. So that's not saying, you know, never buy anything new again. But when you are buying new, again, just try and do it in a more conscious way. Try and, um, uh, I, I do a, a sort of six week how to be sustainable-ish course online. And, um, and without me even saying anything about um, Amazon and buying stuff on Amazon and things, um, a couple of people said, oh, you know, I'd realized during lockdown, I was buying everything on Amazon. It was just my default. It's easy. It's quick. You'll get it next day. And, and I suddenly realized that, you know, I'm not saying I'm never going to buy use Amazon again, but that I 
would um, be looking elsewhere, looking to see if there was a local option or a, an independent shop that I could buy it from, still online because we were in lockdown, but, um, you know, making these more conscious, more deliberate decisions. So can you look for, especially with Christmas coming up, can you, look, you know, can you, independent businesses are really struggling. Can you support your local independent businesses? Um, can you support um, fair trade, organic, all those kinds of things. Um, I'll talk about this again at the end, but, you know, there's this great quote that I'll, talk about at the end about um you know when you uh, when you spend your money you're casting a vote for the kind of world you want so you know if you don't want Jeff Bezos to have all your money don't give him all your money if you want to see a really vibrant um high street then make sure you go and support it uh I never thought I would be a hierarchy geek but it turns out I am because this is a second hierarchy and as many slides and this is the waste hierarchy and I certainly never thought I would be a waste hierarchy geek but again, this is when we talk about the concept, um, if anybody's sort of on social media and, and following any sort of um, sustainability people, um, you know, there's a there's quite a big zero waste movement online. And the, the idea of zero waste, I find quite intimidating because I I remember one week quite excitedly, one week, one year saying, I'm going to join in with zero waste week. I'm going to do zero waste week. I'm going to be zero waste for the week. Went and, I don't know, got a stock cube out of the cupboard and was like, no, I'm not going to be zero waste this week, am I? <laughs> it's really, really, really hard. And it takes an awful lot of planning. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it it does take a lot of big changes in your life. But I think we can all be zero waste-ish. So we can all be much more mindful of the things that we're throwing away. And the reason it matters about the things that we're throwing away is that, um, A, we're running out of resources to make things. We have this linear economy at the moment. So we make things, we dig stuff up, we make things out of it, we use them, we throw them away. Only um, this, there's a brilliant little 20 minute um, documentary called The Story of Stuff. And in there, um, Annie Leonard talks about the fact that only 1% of the stuff that we buy, of, of the materials used to make the things that we buy are still in use six months later, 1%. Like that just blows my mind. So let's all, the, 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 the trying to reduce the amount of stuff that we're throwing away actually needs to start right at the very beginning with looking at the stuff that we're buying. So refusing and reducing are really, really important. Um, let's think about Halloween coming up. Can we refuse? Um, I was I was in the queue to go into the supermarket the other day and outside there was um, plastic kind of like hazard tape with Halloween stuff on it. And, you know, plastic um, uh, sort of almost like decorative curtainy things, all single use plastic, all probably gonna be used once and thrown away. Can we say, not gonna bother with that this year. Um, can we um, reduce the amount of um, clothes that we're buying? Fast fashion is, or the fashion industry is responsible for around 5%, I think, of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and to put it in context, the aviation industry that we all, you know, are all told is the big bad, um, big baddies, and I'm not saying they're not big baddies, but that's two to 4%. Um, and not all of us fly, but all of us wear clothes. So that is something we can all do something about. We can hold on to the clothes we've got for longer. We can repair them. We can um, reuse them. We can we can reduce the amount that we're buying. Um, and, and all of these things apply to everything. You know, we can all reduce the amount of um, meat and dairy that we're buying, but buy better quality. We don't necessarily have to go vegan, but we can reduce the amount, um, you know, buy less, buy better. And that kind of applies for pretty much everything. Um, when we think about uh, reusing is really, really important. And um, so I've got my reusable coffee cup here, you know, reusable water bottles. I will talk about the, the sort of big four plastics in a minute. But, um, you know, reusing is, is really, really important because all those resources have they've gone into um, things and they need to be um, all the carbon, all the water, all those kinds of things. So a reusable version is always... Well, no, I was going to say a reusable version is always going to be better than a single use version, but a reusable version of anything is only actually better than the single use version if you remember to reuse it. Um, because, you know, there's an awful lot more resources that have gone into making these reusable things because they're more sturdy and more resilient. And um, so that is the key to it is to make sure that you actually do reuse these things. Um, Rehoming, just checking time. Rehoming. Um, so I think lots of us had a... Um, a clear out maybe during lockdown. I say us, I didn't. Um, lots of people had a clear out during lockdown and are now left with all this stuff that they, they need to pass on and they need to rehome. Um, and I think charity shops are absolutely inundated. So, um, 
and just bear in mind that um, we shouldn't be using charity shops as a sort of panacea almost for our own continued overconsumption. So if we've had a big clear out over lockdown and gone, oh my God, look at all this stuff. What am I gonna do with it? Where has it even come from? Hopefully we can use that as a reminder to go back to the bottom of this hierarchy and to think a bit more carefully about the stuff that we're buying because um, you know, charity shops are absolutely inundated. When they are donated clothes, only 10 to 30% of the clothes that are donated are actually resold within that charity shop or within the UK. A lot of it then gets um, shipped um, over the developing world in what is now a billion dollar industry, the secondhand textile industry. And it, they are inundated now too. And there are mountains of our cheap fast fashion clothes just sat rotting in the developing world. Um, and in the same, you know, the same way that our, our mountains of plastic were, can you hear the dog? She's not playing, she's not playing being quiet, is she? <laughs> um, so yeah, just think really, really carefully. If you wouldn't buy it from a charity shop, don't give it to a charity shop. If it's got, if it's broken, if it's missing pieces, if it's missing, even if it's missing a button, they don't have the resources to, um, to fix these things and to, to then put them on the shop floor. So all we're doing is passing on that guilt on to, to somebody else that um, to, to then um, put it into landfill. Um, so if you are looking to rehome, have a look at things like FreeCycle and Freegal, which are, are free um, online platforms that you can rehome stuff. Olio, which is a started off as a food sharing app, but now you can can rehome um, anything to your anything legal to your um, local community and to your neighbours. Um, so, you know, have a think a little bit outside the box as to what you can do with your stuff, um, especially at the moment when the charity shops are so overwhelmed. Um, repairing, I think, is a sort of under... I think repairing is making a comeback. When I did um, our year buying nothing new, I discovered this amazing project called Repair Cafes, and, uh, which started in the Netherlands. And the idea is they're pop-up events with volunteer repairers, and you can take along your broken things and they will help you or show you how to repair them for free. Um, and when I first looked, there were three in the UK, so this is in 2012, and now there are hundreds. It has, you know, it has really taken off. Sadly, they're all on hold at the moment um, because of COVID. But again, you know, I think we're, we're told that stuff isn't made to be repaired anymore. But um, actually, you know, it is, it can be quite easy to repair things. YouTube is your friend. Google is your friend. Um, you know, have a little look online. Somebody somewhere will have a tutorial to do something. So, you know, have a go. And the best thing is you can't make it any worse. It's already broken. Um, I think probably one of the most interesting things to note about this hierarchy is that recycle is right, is penultimate, isn't it? It's second to last. It's, it's towards the very top. And I said right at the very beginning that, you know, I, I thought I was pretty green. I was doing my recycling. Um, but actually, you know, recycling isn't the magic bullet we were sold. Um, it still takes an awful lot of um, energy to recycle things and things um, often are downcycled. So that means they're made into sort of inferior products. So a lot of plastic things will be downcycled into um, park benches or things like that. Um, so um, absolutely do all your recycling, check on your local ca um, council website what can be recycled. Um, don't wish cycle, which is where you put something in the recycling because you feel like it it looks recyclable and it should be recyclable because it, it um, sort of messes the whole recycling stream. So don't, um, so absolutely do recycle, but bear in mind that it's, you know, if we're applying all these other parts of the hierarchy first, then we should hopefully be reducing our, our recycling a little bit as well. And then the very top of the hierarchy there is, is rot. So that's um, landfill. Um, a lot of councils now are doing um, energy from waste, which is, uh, a little bit controversial um, uh, in that, um, completely lost my train of thought, um, like energy from waste. So the idea is that, that our waste goes and gets burnt and the energy that's produced is then used to heat homes. Um, but there are some arguments against it. So ultimately, you know, we want to be reducing landfill and we want to be reducing energy from waste as well. So we apply the waste hierarchy. I hope everyone's keeping up with this. It's really, it's quite difficult doing virtual presentations because you don't get any feedback and you feel like you're just blurting out at people for um, 40 or 45 minutes. So I hope everybody's kind of um, keeping up. So the next one is plastic free. And again, I, I talk about plastic free-ish because um, I think the notion of plastic free is very, very difficult. I think in the modern world, it's, it's virtually impossible to be plastic free. 
Um, and actually, when we're talking about being plastic free, we're, we're really talking about single use plastic because, you know, like I'm just sat here and I'm sat on a chair that undoubtedly has plastic on it. I'm looking at my keyboard. I'm looking at my monitor. There is plastic in all of that, but it's um, it's plastic that's going to stay in use for a long time. So what we're really focused on is the single use plastic. Enough plastic is thrown away each year to circle the earth four times. And I, um, I can't remember when this stat was from, but it's probably got worse. So if you are looking at um, to reduce your plastic, the easiest place to start is, is the big four. So these are the most commonly used um, single use plastics. So swapping them for reusable versions. So we've got shopping bags, coffee cups, water bottles and straws. Was it last week or the week before a ban came in in the UK on um, single use plastic straws and stirrers and things like that? So that's great. Um, uh, shopping bags, um, hopefully we're all pretty good now at taking our reusable shopping bags when we go and do the shop. I know it's been difficult during um, COVID and during lockdown, a lot of the online supermarkets weren't taking the plastic bags back. So I think a lot of people now have this small sort of plastic bag mountain. Um, if you do have single use carrier bags at home, just keep using them, use them for everything. You know, instead of buying bin liners, use them for that. Just keep keep, keep on using them until they start to fall apart. And then they can go in the, um, a lot of the supermarkets will have a carrier bag recycling station outside. So any stretchy plastic, anything, so like the plastic that comes around your apples and your um, fruit and your veg, that can go in there. Bread bags, that can go in there. Um, so keep your eyes out for them. Um, the, the thing I used to get caught out with was, um, you know, when I was just, popping in for a pint of milk and then you end up buying like 10 items and then I was that person at the till adamantly refusing to take a bag and juggling everything and um you know getting the kids to hold things and and spilling things on the floor because I just des desperately didn't want to take a bag so now I um I have a reusable you know one of the little fold-up ones in my backpack in the car glove box in the um you know in my handbag it just uh, kind of to give me as little chance as possible of not having a bag um somebody gave me a great tip which was those little fold up ones to to clip them onto your keys so you you're onto your house key so you literally cannot leave the house without them um uh coffee cups i mean we're all going out a lot less now so um and i know a lot of the um coffee chains aren't taking reusable coffee cups there is a brilliant campaign by um the charity city to see called contactless coffee which shows is a little video that shows how you can um you know have your your coffee in a reusable cup without the barista having to touch it at all um so you know if you've got a local independent coffee shop that you want to support and um you're, they're not doing this um you know just just maybe drop them a um drop them a message on social media and say oh guys i've seen this campaign do you reckon this is something you might be able to incorporate um you know this is something you'd be comfortable doing and um let's see if we can get people happier because there is no um evidence that disposables are actually any better when it comes to um disease transmission and things so um you know we need to not let the big chains sort of um take back um, control of this sort of single use plastics argument, I guess. Um, reusable water bottles, again, just remember to take it out with you. There's a brilliant app called the Refill app you can get, which is another um, of City to Seas um, projects. And you can get it on your phone and it will let you know where there's um, cafes or um, shops or anywhere nearby that is happy for you to refill your water bottle. I'm aware of time, so I'm gonna skip over straws because um, we've got that new legislation in place. Food, um, again, in the same way that we all have to wear clothes, we all have to eat, don't we? And when we think about sustainable food and, and ethical food, um, there's there's the um, the the idea that we, you know, if we're going to eat ethically, we've got to be vegan. Um, and I'm not vegan. I do get berated about this by um, eco warriors, um, but um, actually reducing food waste just scrapes it in terms of impact um, above going plant-based. Um, it's very, very small, but it does. So actually we can all reduce food waste. Um, if food waste were a country, it would be the third biggest emitter of global greenhouse gases after the USA and China. And 50% of food waste occurs in the home. So, you know, we all think about the supermarkets discarding the wonky veg and, um, you know, the huge amount there must be in the restaurant industry and things, but 50% occurs in the home. So that's in, in my house, in your house, and that's something we can all do something about. Um, so meal planning is, a, is dull and grown up and whatever, but it is actually one of the most effective ways of um, reducing food waste. So 
You know, it doesn't have to be hours spent at the kitchen table pouring over recipe books. Beans on toast can be on there and as much as a three course dinner. Um, and, and just my top tip is to include a bit of white space so that if there is a day when you get home from work and you're absolutely knackered um, and, and nobody's up for cooking, then, you know, you can get a takeaway. Um, but um, yeah, just just use that to think about, especially now, you know, kids are back at school and maybe some clubs are on and things. And so um, there'll be, um, you know, some nights when when you need a really quick meal so you can think about that. There'll be some nights when actually um, everybody's got to eat at different times and things. So meal planning can really, really help. Um, there's a there's a, a brilliant app actually called Cozo, which is C-O-Z-Z-O, which allows you to keep a sort of online inventory of what you've got in your cupboards and in your fridge and in your freezer. And one of the great things it can do is if you've got leftovers, you can take a picture of it, um, put, a, a you know, a, an eat by date of a couple of days time on there. Um, and then um, it will send you a reminder that that, you know, because I don't know about you guys, but if I put stuff in Tupperware and especially if it's not see through Tupperware um, at the back, you know, it gets pushed to the back of the fridge and it gets forgotten about. So it will then send you a reminder that that needs eating up or it needs freezing. The other thing you can do is put an eat me first box in your fridge or an eat me first shelf so that everybody knows that the, the stuff on there is the stuff that's got a shorter date on it and that needs eating up. So um, I'm quite um geeky about food waste I quite um it's one of my big things to bang on about the other big thing I bang on about is moving your energy supplier I think this is hands down one of the I think it probably is the most impactful thing we can do as individuals um if you switch to a tariff that has um Renewable electricity and carbon offset gas according to bulb it could slash your carbon footprint by up to a quarter and Again, it's dull, it's grown up, it feels like it's going to be a real pain in the bum to do, but actually it's not that hard. There's um, an online comparison site, um, energy comparison site called Big Clean Switch, and they only have um, renewable tariffs on there. So you grab a recent bill, so you get an accurate quote, you go, um, you go onto Big Clean Switch, you put all your details in and it will pull up... Um, it, it will pull up a load of quotes for you and then you pick the one that suits you best. I did a campaign um, last year with my audience and people saved, you know, about £300 some people were saving. So, you know, not only will it slash your carbon footprint, it could um, save you not an insignificant amount of money. And it um, and actually, you know, I, I always say it could be done in an ad break. It can be done from the sofa, certainly. So it doesn't have to be hugely... Um, onerous and time consuming. And just that little graph there is showing um, some of the choices that we can make as individuals and the impact that they have. So it's one of the high impact things. It's up there, um, it's, it's sandwiched in between avoid one transatlantic flight and switching from an electric car to going car free. So, you know, it's, it's pretty big impact. Um, and as I said, once it's done, it's done and you don't need to worry about it and you just sit back and, and be smug. Um, so if, if I'm going to ask everybody at the end to make a little promise for the planet. And if, you know, if some of you go away saying you're going to do that, I will be very, very happy indeed. And then the last one, how are we doing for time? We're doing all right, um, is everyday activism. And I think, um, I don't know about you guys, but when I hear the word activism, I find it quite um, off-putting maybe. Um, I don't I don't think of myself as an activist. I um I'm, I'm actually quite introverted and I, you know, I did go on a climate march last year and it was massively out of my comfort zone and um, I felt quite uncomfortable and we think, you know, if we're going to be activists, we've got to be there with our placards and we've got to be shouting and we've got to be gluing ourselves to buses, but actually we all have the potential, this is the whole um, concept, I guess, of sustainability, we all have the potential to be activists every single day. Every time we spend money, this is the quote I referred to at the beginning, um, we're casting a vote for the kind of world that we want. Um, so if there, there will um, be lots of people out there who don't have the luxury of being able to make um, decisions financially, you know, for the kind of world that they want. But if you are fortunate enough to be in a position where um, you know, you're, you're not on the breadline and you are, you do have, um, a little bit of, of wriggle room in the things that in the money that you're spending, um, then always just try and spend a little bit more thoughtfully. So not only do we have a huge amount of power in the choices that we're making every day, um, 
the, the things that we're buying and importantly, the things that we're not buying, you know, we can choose to not upgrade our phone just because Apple tells us to. We can choose to um, not throw out our jeans just because they've got a hole in them and we can have a go at repairing them. And it's um, I was asked to do a TEDx talk during our year buying nothing new. And the theme was everyday radicals. And I was like, I'm, I'm not a radical. But the more I thought about it and the more I speak about it and the more I look back on it in hindsight, it is a really countercultural act to um, to sort of push back a little bit on consumerism because the whole time we're being bombarded with all these messages about um, the, the, the fact that we, you know, if we buy X, Y and Z, we'll be prettier, more beautiful, look younger, be um, have more friends, whatever. Like it's just insidious, this marketing all the time. So we've got a huge amount of power in the choices that we're making and the things that we're choosing to buy or not buy. And our voices are actually much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. So if we're to take the, the example of switching energy suppliers, we can ramp up, um, we can amplify that action, that one action. So we've, um, we've decided that we're going to move our energy supplier. So we're taking our money away from the company whose practices we don't agree with, and we're giving our money to the practices that to the company with the practices we do agree with. So we're sending out a message via our money to um, the energy sector that we want more renewables. We can then amplify that message by emailing the company that we've just left and saying, I've just left and I just thought you'd like to know it's because I want to support a company that um, are doing, um, I want to move to a renewable tariff and um, I want to support a company that are doing these things. So you've amplified your message. You then amplify that message again by going on social media and going, oh my God, guys, I've just switched my energy supply to a renewable um, tariff. It was really easy. I've saved some money. And you know what? Here's a discount code. So you're not berating anybody. You're not telling your friends that they're all horrible for um, having a, um, a fossil fuel tariff. You're just saying, like, look what I've just done. And the more we can normalize these actions that we're doing and these changes that we're making in a very gentle, very non-confrontational way, the more we can kind of um, make it um, acceptable and um, sort of mainstream for everybody else to do it as well. So, you know, I, I, like I said, we need big changes from government. We need big changes from business. But I, I absolutely stand by that as individuals, we can have an impact. We've just seen the ban come in on plastic straws. That was all bottom up um, pressure from um from individuals um, putting pressure on governments and on corporations. We've just seen um, this week, um, several of the supermarkets said that their Christmas wrapping paper isn't gonna have glitter on it because glitter is actually a microplastic and, and causes problems and makes um, wrapping paper non-recyclable. That has all come from consumers you know, actively spending their money on other alternatives or letting them know through social media or uh, whatever that they don't want that. So we absolutely do have power to change things. Um, so I always say to uh, whenever I do a talk um, and, and those little uh, scraps of paper from when we were allowed to do proper online, uh, proper in-person talks and I would take along some scraps of paper for people to write their promises on, I would absolutely love um, everybody who's come and listened today to make a promise for the planet. One small, tiny, doesn't matter how tiny, how small it's going to be. If it's like, I will remember my coffee cup, my reusable coffee cup next time I go out. If it's, um, or are you going to change your energy supplier or, um, you know, just one tiny little change. Uh, if you want to pop it in the chat, that would warm the very cockles of my heart to see it because I always say there is no point um coming and sitting for an hour listening to me talk at you there is no point reading a book there is no point watching a documentary or whatever you do if nothing changes because nothing changes if nothing changes so um be brave pop your promise in there let's um let's see if we can get some promises for the planet coming out of um today's talks there's all my social media if you want to come and find me on um online and a quote from the amazing, wonderful Greta, no one is too small to make a difference. Everyone can do something. If everyone did something, huge differences can happen. So that feels quite a nice place for me to stop rabbiting on at you and to see if we've got any questions. I think Chloe's gonna come back on and there we go. There's Chloe, brilliant. That wasn't too bad for time, was it? Well done me. <laughs> Spot on, well done, Jen. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was really great. I am a big sustainable geek, I think, but it's very nice to hear about lots of things I haven't thought about. Um, okay, questions. Um, oh, somebody said, could you repeat the name of the app for recording groceries that you already have? They missed Ozo, C-O-Z-Z-O. -Z -Z -O. It was 
just on Apple. They were working on bringing out an Android version. I'm not sure if that's happened yet, but I think it's if it's not there yet, it's it's certainly in the pipeline. So Z C O Z Z O. Brilliant. Um, you said um, when there's a sort of compulsion often to buy things if we're happy or we're sad or we're celebrating. And is there something you like to do instead of buying things? Have you got a sort of go to way to celebrate or? personally I've never been a big shopper so it's not um it's not really my um my idea of a you know <laughs> a fun thing to go and do um I mean there's there's the there's the whole you know go for a walk or um read a book or and but I get that you know there is that certain endorphin hit we get when we buy something new um the I guess um there's a brilliant book called it's by the, the founder of a website called Buy Me Once, and it is called, she says, frantically trying to find it. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, but she used to work in advertising, and so she knows all the um, sort of the ways, I guess, we're manipulated by marketing. And, and Tara talks about, um, oh, it's called the Life Less Throwaway. I told you it would come to me. Um, that, you know, trying to identify what, I, you know, it, okay, so I'm ha I, I'm sad, actually, you know, oh, why, why do I want this? Because actually I'm really fed up and I'm bored and my wardrobe looks boring or, do you know, like, so, so actually trying to get to the, to the underlying issue that you're using the shopping tool fulfill that, that I don't, I don't know that there is a necessary going to be a kind of one size fits all solution to it. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, maybe it is a, it sounds a bit kind of woo woo or whatever, but, but really kind of trying to think about what's, what's driving this, desire to buy and you know we all logically know it isn't probably going to make us happier longer term um but there is that kind of shorter term endorphin hit isn't it so how can I be kind to myself or reward myself in some other way um there's um another great book called Stuffocation and um and in there he talks about you know um actually spending our money on experiences rather than things so that can be um you know quite useful so maybe you reward yourself with a meal out with your other half or whatever rather than um stuff that's going to clutter up your life so it's not massively helpful but I don't know that there is a super helpful <laughs> I think experience is not things is my sort of life mantra actually um, someone says, in your year of not buying anything new, what were the hardest things not to buy as a family with young children? Um, the hardest thing for me, which I am aware makes me sound very, very shallow, was magazines. I think just because I always, when you're buying a magazine, you're not necessarily buying a magazine, are you? You're buying into the idea that, that you're the sort of person who has half an hour to sit down with a nice hot cup of tea and flick through a magazine and obviously you know the kids were four and two or something that was never ever going to happen um so I found I found that really difficult and I quite liked you know I would quite like to buy craft magazines and um in the aspiration that I was going to be able to have time to make all these things and never did um with the kids I think it was more about um forward planning I'm not very uh, good at planning and thinking ahead so you'd suddenly get to the first cold day of the of the year and suddenly preschool are saying they all need hats and, and then you're there going oh god we had gloves last year and where are they and um you know and then suddenly you're sort of having to rely on the the charity shop fairies shining down on you having the right size wellies or um that sort of thing um and I think gifts was quite difficult as well for birthday parties my son started preschool that year and so you know suddenly they were like just birthday parties all the time and having to try and find um ways of giving gifts without um buying new stuff and without and and that whole feeling of being judged by the other parents for you know if, if you if you make some biscuits or if you give them a handmade gift are they going to think you're really weird or like one time I found some marbles in the charity shop and made a little drawstring bag and printed out a load of things with different marble games and I was like they're just gonna think I'm really mean and weird and so it's it's th th those kinds of things were difficult when you're sort of um pushing back a little bit on on um sort of societal expectations as well I think mm -hmm. um another app repeating question can you repeat the name of the app for finding drinking water refills refill so the refill app nice and easy um, R E F I L L. Um, yeah, I think if you just um, search in your app store for refill, it should come up. Um, and or if not, go to um, City to C, um, which is um, City and then T O C, 
um, and it's all the information should be on there as well. Yes, I have it on my phone. Uh, oh, somebody also says that this is not a question. This is an information. There are free library apps where you can read magazines online. Yes, we have. Um, I, I discovered during lockdown, actually, we had um, the, our, our library. Yeah, you can get magazines, you can get ebooks, and you can get audio books as well. And so they've had all the all the Harry Potters, all the David Walliams and stuff. And, you know, certainly during lockdown when, you know, the kids were just getting, they'd be, I don't know, doing Lego or something and just starting to bicker with each other. And you just put that on and it was just enough to kind of distract them. So, um, yeah, do support your local library and um, have a look and see what they've got online as well. Um, here's a good one from Colin. He says, won't the economy a clap? Uh, won't the economy collapse if we stop buying things? Won't the planet collapse if we don't stop buying things, Colin? Um, I'm not an economist. I make no claims to be an economist. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. I know in the States when they've been talking about this Green New Deal, um, you know, there are an awful lot of jobs that can be created in renewables, in recycling, in creating. So I talked about that linear economy where we extract stuff, we make it, we use it, we throw it away. What we need to move to is this um, circular economy where we, um, you know, we, we make stuff, we use it, and it can be, though it can be, it's made to be repaired or it's made to be um, modular so that things can be reincorporated back into the system. And there are an awful lot of jobs that can be created from that. Um, if we look at the, uh, we were talking about, you know, buying experiences, not things. So we're shifting away from, a, from a, um, an economy whereby we buy stuff and we look at buying um, experiences and going for meals out and, um, you know, days out and things like that. So there are, are ways of keeping the economy going. And I think this argument that um, it's, I guess it's a bit like COVID, you know, we need to balance keeping the virus down at the same time as keeping the economy going. We there is no business to be done on a dead planet. And we are literally reaching that point where we, we have to start to make some hard decisions. So, um, you know, it's for people far more educated and intelligent and economist minded than, than me. But I think, you know, there are ways that it can happen and there are millions of jobs that can be created by the green economy. Um, you know, we, we need, at the moment, we, um, we have this perception that, you know, we can grow um, grow our economies infinitely and we live on a finite planet and we need to find ways to, to marry those two up. So I don't know what the answer is, but I know that we're going to have to find it. Mm. Um, okay, one more question and then I'm going to read out the promises that we've got. If anyone's not, put, put your promises. Oh, yeah, put your promises in, guys. I won't, name, I won't name you, so you can have your <laughs> anonymous promise. Um, Someone says, what impact on the environment do you think our obsession with having domestic pets is? Oh, really good one. See, we've got a dog. You heard the dog barking. I wrote a blog post recently, 10 reasons why I'm, or 10 things that I still do that make me a really crap environmentalist. And one of them is having the dog. Um, I think uh, if we look at it purely from a, you know, an environmental perspective, yes, we, we probably shouldn't have pets. I used to be a vet. So, you know, bear in mind, this is probably going to be quite a skewed um, viewpoint I also think pets um contribute a huge amount to our mental health to our you know and and like we've got dogs to physical health it helped us no end to get the kids out every day during lockdown because we had to go and walk the dog um uh there are ways that you can reduce the impact significantly the smaller the smaller the pet you have the smaller its footprint will be um we have um you know buying things secondhand for it like the the pet industry is billions of pounds and you know you can buy anything you want for your dog or your cat now it, it it is quite bonkers so you know consuming more thoughtfully for them trying to consume secondhand we feed our dog food a pet food called um our dog food we feed our dog a dog food called yora which is y-o-r-a and it's made from insects um so there's this um within the the pet food industry now there's this you know um a a there's these, all these boutique pet foods and they're using human grade, premium grade meat, um, you know, that, that's going to feed our dogs and our dogs and our cats. And there are people in food poverty. There are millions of people starving around the world. And we're using all this amazing quality um, meat, uh, you know, which we know has a high impact to feed our pets. Um, so this pet food called Yura, I did a podcast with the um, founder of it. It's these little kind of like, 
great big maggots, basically, I think. Um, they're fed on food waste and the, the energy that, that is generated by the, by the maggoty things when they're eating um, heats the factory. And then that's ground into a powder and um, mixed up and made into a food. So there are some really great um, things to, that, that are you know coming online um but yeah ultimately i guess if you want to be the greenest of green um you don't have a pet but you, again it's it's always a balancing act isn't it that's why it's sustainable ish because it's balancing up the the benefits that it has on our mental health and our physical health and well-being as well mm, brilliant okay i'm going to read some promises out Yay. um so let's look I, uh, someone says i promise to cut down on plastic use this christmas glitter amazing etc um, someone says, I will look at energy suppliers and change mm. to renewable energy. Uh, another one, we're going to explore changing our energy supply. Oh, amazing. So guys, that, that website again was Big Clean Switch. I think it's .org. So all one word, bigcleanswitch.org if people want to oh, my kids are so, can you be quiet for an hour? Yes, well, we will be quiet for an hour. No. I mean, they're, they're almost nailed it, you know. <laughs> I think they've been quiet-ish, so we can probably feel Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, someone says, I promised to buy one copy of your book for Christmas, but I will be lending it to friends too. Great. Job. Oh, thank you. Um, someone says, I promised to darn socks. Actually, that's mine too. Yes. I have to learn. If anyone at Berwick knows how to darn socks, could you uh, come and give me a tutorial, please? <laughs> but I've got, we did, um, I did an online festival during lockdown and there's an online tutorial there if you want. So it's on the website. If you look at the festival, there's an online darning tutorial in there. Right. That's what I need. Because um, my socks are all, I've got, the house I live in has lots of big nails that stick up. Oh, wow. have got holes in, I would say, almost every pair of my socks. Slippers is what you need, Chloe, slippers. Slippers is what I need. Um, someone says, my promise is to buy no more clothes and shoes for at least a year. Amazing. Brilliant. I'm loving all these. And someone else says, I promise to set up my milk delivery this week. Yes, well done. So, there you are, excellent promises. Um, oh. And someone says, my promise is to repair my clothes more. Brilliant. Amazing. I'm absolutely loving all these. Thank you, guys. Sometimes I ask everyone to make a promise of planet and everyone just goes and sort of looks away. <laughs> so this is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to round up there or we're going to run out of time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jen. That was very brilliant, very informative. Thank you. And very interesting. Um, just to remind people, if you'd like to buy a copy of Jen's book, I would recommend you go to your local bookshop there it is i've got mine here too um, <laughs> you can go to greaves in berwick um if you've enjoyed the session today and you'd like to donate to the festival please do we're very small we're run by volunteers and we rely on the generous sponsorship of local patrons and businesses and usually ticket sales but not this year so there'll be a link in the chat that you can click um also a slight plug i'm part of a new climate action group that's just started in Berwick. But if anyone local thinks, maybe I'd like to do some more. Amazing. Get in touch. Oh, well done, Chloe. Um, but yeah, thank you, Jen. Uh, thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend, Jen, and everyone else. And I hope. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And yes, guys, please do, if you can afford to, make a little donation to the, um, to the Literary Festival. And thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you.